Welcome back to the Lithar Literature Festival 2020. Our session for today is Running Towards Mystery, a conversation with Venerable Tenzing Priyadarshi, moderated by Sri Rixen Sampe. The Venerable Tenzing Priyadarshi is President and CEO of the Dalai Lama Center for Ethics and Transformative Values at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, a center dedicated to inquiry, dialogue and education on the ethical and humane dimensions of life. Sri Rixen Sampel is the Commissioner Secretary Tourism of UT Ladakh. He joined the IS in 2003 and has served in a number of senior positions in the state of Uttar Pradesh and the erstwhile state of JNK. Join this candid conversation with Venerable Tenzing Priyadarshi about his book, Running Towards Mystery, and on the issues of modern day living in the context of Buddhist teachings. Venerable, thank you very much for participating in and agreeing to be part of the Ladakh Literature Festival. A warm jule to you from Ladakh. It's a delight. Thank you for having me. For the uninitiated, we have your book out here and it's been a wonderful experience reading the book, Running Towards Mystery. Whenever everything starts with a motivation, uh, so I'd, I'll start this uh, session by asking you what was the motivation for writing this book? It's a memoir. Uh, you are young, I mean, uh, whole life. <laughs> Well, so, it's it's yeah. Uh, no, thank you for that. It's it's not exactly a memoir in the strictest sense. Um, uh, uh, the publishers wanted me to write a memoir, but I told them precisely that that I'm too young to write a memoir, and I change my mind every day. So the memoir bit is a little bit in the beginning, um, where I speak of my sort of early childhood and uh, initial sort of episodes of life. But then much of the book is focused on the wonderful, uh, uh, some of the wonderful teachers uh, that I met along the way and who have uh, influenced uh, my thinking and my choices in life. Uh, so I would think, I would like to think more of it as a tribute to, to some of those teachers. I must confess, book that I've come closest to after, uh, you know, it reminds me after reading your book is, the autobiography of a yogi. Uh, so, oh, uh, so people that's a who very haven't kind comparison. <laughs> so, so people who haven't uh, read your book, I would actually insist that uh, I mean this is a book to go for uh, in case you're looking for spiritual answers and uh, uh, a lot of things which remain unanswered in our, our lives. Uh, Vendibal, I'll start with how you mentioned that uh, as early as when you were six years of age, uh, you started having those vivid dreams about uh, places you you had never been to. A personality you had never met before and it so happens that at the age of 10 you run away from your school and uh, you actually land up uh, reaching the place you had been seeing in your dreams and actually uh, coming across information about the person unfortunately the person Fuji Guruji wasn't alive then this is in the realms of uh, mysticism magic uh, and belief but you live in MIT it's a mecca of logic, rational uh, thinking and uh, technology. So uh, first of all, for an ignorant mind, is there a contradiction between these two lives that you live? And if there is, how does it reconcile in uh, your mind? I think uh, it's, I wouldn't sort of label it as a contradiction. Um, I think in the, as I mentioned in the prologue of the book, that uh, oftentimes we, try to interpret our life experiences in a binary way by calling something irrational or calling something rational. And the decision that I made at the age of 10 of running away, I have put it in the category of non-rational, meaning that, yes, I could in, in, in some ways say that as a 10-year-old, I did not make a decision that was grounded in reason. But at the same time, it wasn't a completely irrational decision. Um, mm -hmm. So. So having a third mode of thinking around non-rational things. Uh, the other thing that we need to understand as humans is that, you know, humans are largely irrational creatures, you see? Meaning if you observe our decision-making pattern, uh, it's mostly irrational. What we do is rational storytelling, you know? 
So we make a decision, we make a choice, but we want to sound smart about those choices. So we come up with the rational storytelling. And so even some of my friends in neuroscience these days, uh, some of my colleagues here, they have been doing some studies on, uh, on ethical decision-making in brains. And, and, and they say that oftentimes the neurons for decision-making fires much before the person is able to suggest what it is that they're about to do. Okay. Um, so I think, you know, when I use the title running toward mystery, the, the whole idea of mystery is that we should maintain a sense of curiosity, a sense of open-mindedness towards a lot that which we do not know uh, about ourselves, about the world. And we ourselves as humans are the biggest mystery of all how we function, how we look at things, how we make decisions. Those are the biggest scientific mysteries uh, that still sort of challenges us. Great, uh, because I remember back in college uh, reading about a thinker called Herbert Simon, and he had this concept of bounded rationality. And he would say, uh, we think that we are being rational and we land up taking biggest decisions of our life, be it uh, profession, be it marriage, thinking that we are making a rational decision because for want of choice, and uh, had we had a bigger universe or the options, things could have been different. Uh, yep. so right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's 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 hard to come up with uh, algorithms for irrational behavior. You know, so mm -hmm. so we have to sort of uh, use kind of rational flowcharts and mechanisms to to sort of come up with a link for why I chose this, why I decided this. And you know, I mean, the 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 part is that I that I have often told individuals is that you know from the age ten onwards I can link everything to this point in time and say why certain decisions led to where I am today. But I have tried to think hard uh, about trying to come up with a rational pattern prior to that, and and it just eludes me. Yeah. Uh, so, Vendable, you mean uh, the concept of free will? Uh, it does not exist. Or, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I think I, uh, I, I take a slightly different uh, sort of look on that. I, I think uh, uh, free will is for highly realized people. And uh, what we have, what we have, is freedom of choice. Okay. Um, and freedom of choice is simply that it's it's a choice of choosing things in the limited probabilistic scenario of things that we see. Uh, free will, uh, in, in some ways, you know, is really requires a greater degree of freedom. But we are all sort of so bound by our behavioral dispositions and ignorance and so on that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, free will is a hard thing. <laughs> My next question uh, would actually uh, trigger us from a very interesting character in your book, the J Japanese monk Sasaki, uh, oh, yes. whom you meet in Sarnath. And uh, going by conventional uh, definition of a monk, he was a contradiction. He was married, wouldn't do much of his pujas, and uh, also was into, into alcohol. But then it seems uh, after reading the book that this monk, who was all contradictions of a conventional monk, was also a source of great wisdom uh, that he passed on to you. For laymen uh, like us, we are caught in the in the samsara. Uh, where does one go looking for a guru? I, th I think the challenge first with uh, uh, you know looking for a teacher is that we shouldn't look for teachers who confirm our own sort of biases. You know. Uh, oftentimes, you know, we have all these presuppositions that my guru is going to look like this, appear like this, speak to me in this way and so on. So what we're doing is we're already limiting our sense of uh, conditions. You know, it's it's like we want to have a guru, but we want to have a guru subjected to our opinions and wills and so on. You see? In that case, even if you find a guru, it's not very useful because you're not willing to give up your uh, uh, presuppositions and so on. And just to give a bit, bit of a background about uh, Reverend Sasaki was that, you know, in, in 1800s, after the Meiji Restoration in Japan, uh, uh, the Japanese government did decide to impose laws of marriages on monastic tradition there. Because, you know, monks are 
uh, renegades in, in, in that regard. They were not married. They didn't have ties to any families. So they were seen as dangerous elements in, in society, like, like rebels. So for the ease of governance, they decided that, you know, monks should get married. And, and you know, Sasaki was a, was a, a product of those kinds of uh, uh, modifications of institutions. Uh, but to his credit, you know, he spent almost 35, 40 years in India uh, and, and built an institution uh, in Sarnath. Um, and and to his credit, he he did everything in open. You know, he did not hide. You know, he did not appear to be holy. Um, and and you really had to sort of, as I as I mentioned, the struggle in my own right that that you had to overcome all your presuppositions uh, in order to look beyond this idea of how wise uh, he actually was. This brings me uh, to the concept of uh, spiritual materialism. Uh, There's this whole idea which you actually uh, mentioned. This yeah. idea of shopping for gurus, uh, shopping for you know uh, spiritual solutions. So, what's your message? I mean, there's, there's a danger line here that people might actually, with the right motivation, but might take the wrong path. That is correct. That is correct. I mean, you know, there's this uh, popular, I think, Russian proverb that uh, path to hell are paved with good motivations. Uh, and as you are aware, you know, the, the Buddhist tradition speaks a lot about motivation, but it's also about refining motivation. It's not about self-righteous motivation. And refinement of motivation is based on this premise that may I attain enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. It doesn't imply how I see it benefiting sentient beings. It has to do with constant refinement of how can I actually excel at the accumulation of wisdom, accumulation of skill sets, to be able to truly benefit, uh, 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 to be able to truly benefit sentient beings. So, one of the things to to recognize is how do we engage in this constant refinement of motivation? For, the, for uh, you know, and and I think that is the thing that we often forget, even when we adapt uh, Buddhism as a as sort of a cultural thing, you know, where. It simply becomes like, uh, you know, we become Buddhist by default. We are born into a Buddhist family, just like we are born into a Hindu family. It's not like we have to work hard to become a Buddhist or a Hindu. The, the, the question becomes is that, you know, when we start to label ourselves as students of Buddha Dharma or practitioners of Buddha Dharma, that calls for a greater level of refinement and commitment um, in the study and practice of these things. And, and, and that's where, you know, the, the role of finding teachers is a, is a helpful thing. And spiritual materialism is a very common trait. It, it has become a very common phenomenon, uh, especially in certain strands of Buddhist tradition where we like to show off, you know, how many teachers we have or how many keys we have collected, uh, you know, in, in terms of statues and malas and blessings and temples and so on, to the point that you get caught up in the drama uh, precisely uh, the drama that we were supposed to get rid of by virtue of our study and practice of Buddha Dharma. Uh, so spiritual materialism is quite pervasive. Um, and in the world that we live in, it is it is a challenging thing to, to recognize that. Uh, in your book, uh, you also give a lot of stress on the concept of spiritual pride. We might be on the right path, we get the right guru, we get the right uh, you know, amount of spiritual accomplishment, but then pride sets in and then everything get, gets washed out. Yes, yes. I, I think that's the most dangerous element of it. Um, you know, ordinary pride we may be able to recognize with the help of a teacher and so on. But spiritual pride is much more sly, it's much more, much more agile because spiritual pride knows you very well. It knows you better than you think. Yeah, uh, it knows you. And so it constantly shows off in the way you carry yourself, in the way you uh, interact with individuals. And you look at it, you know, uh, when you observe the history of Buddha Dharma in India, in Tibet, in other countries, uh, for example, the the legends and life of the great Kadampa masters, uh, you see that how much they are emphasizing this idea of being vigilant and observant of how spiritual pride may arise. And it could arise at any given time. And, and we see that quite often uh, in, the, in the Buddhist hierarchy, where spiritual pride leads to certain regression 
of spiritual qualities and, and so on. And so it's important to recognize that, you know, when we choose a spiritual path, the idea is not that we translate our ordinary pride into some greater pride, you know, now, not that the pride becomes a holier pride or a spiritual pride uh, in some way, uh, but to truly relinquish uh, pride, to truly sort of struggle with it and, and try to eliminate it. That is, I think, part of the objective of a, of a spiritual life. Uh, true. Uh, when the book, uh, I go back to the book and your experience and the motivation with the, as a child and it changed your entire life. You also uh, mentioned the Hindi word sanskara. Yeah. Uh, some impressions that we carry from the previous, uh, I mean, that is the closest definition I can think of previous life. You also talk about tulkus. You talk about reincarnation. How do you scientifically define and um, justify for somebody who's from a background who's based on logic, mathematics, physics? I think, you know, the, the challenge is that the so-called experimental verification you see, of, of tulkus or the phenomena of, of re, re, rebirth or reincarnation. I mean, there is a distinction between rebirth and reincarnation. Right? Reincarnation, uh, rebirth is something that everybody goes through. Uh, you know, uh, reincarnation implies a level of realization where an individual is perhaps able to choose which form, which location they're able to born in. So they, they're able to dictate to, to some degree of clarity where they're going to be born. And it has, again, a, a particular objective and so on. Now, so one of the things that I often tell, you know, from a, from a scientific perspective is that when a phenomenon occurs once or twice or three times, you find it curious. When it happens 10 or 15 times, you say, okay, it's an interesting pattern that we should begin to explore. If it happens more than that, you say, okay, now this phenomena is worth studying. You see? And that's what I find with, with this, this idea of, uh, of uh, reincarnation, that there are enough sociological cases and examples of recognition with some degree of consistency that I think it, it's well worth the scientific exploration. The challenge with an experimental study of reincarnation is that it's a very longitudinal study. Meaning, you know, here we are talking about, you know, neuroscience study that goes on for 25, 30 years, and we think it's a long time. And when you start to study sort of reincarnation as a phenomenon, we are looking at 150 years, 200 years of studying the same subject under certain kinds of constraints and, and so on. So it, it does pose a certain kind of challenge. But if you look into, you know, sort of simple uh, sort of ideas, you know, the second law of thermodynamics you see, uh, um, of uh, what the fate of energy is, how energy is conserved and so on. That it again is a function of worldview that if you recognize that human consciousness or consciousness in general is not something that is purely of material properties, right? That, that it has some other nature, it has some other property because even in scientific community, we don't agree on definition and nature of consciousness, per se. Uh, you know, we may agree on the primacy of human brain, but we don't agree on what consciousness is. And so that's the first sort of challenge uh, uh, because we don't have agreeable definition to study what human consciousness is or how it transfers and so on. But you do see, you know, certain kinds of openings like, you know, because of His Holiness the Dalai Lama's encouragement now, for example, uh, there's a pocket of scientists, not everybody is, is intrigued by it, but trying to study Tugdam you know, uh, as a phenomenon. Again, it's one of those things. Two or three instances of Tugdam in modern day um, India, like we had heard study, uh, uh, we had heard stories of it. But when you start seeing it, and then you start seeing that phenomena repeating itself, it starts becoming, you know, it starts to intrigue you. It starts to say, okay, something is happening there, which is worth exploration. Okay? But again, we don't have a definite study in fact, most of my scientific colleagues perhaps would say they don't even know what they're looking for in Tugdam. They have data sets, but they don't know what they're looking for. Great. Next uh, question would be uh, on technology. Uh, uh, are in place where people talk about machine learning, artificial intelligence, and uh, the mobile phone has become like a organ of our body. We carry it. I mean, it's there with the body throughout. And uh, to some extent, uh, it even knows what we're going to ask. Um, 
you know, uh, in the Google, uh, or for that matter, any other search uh, option that we have. Uh, so, uh, is humanity doomed uh, by technology? Uh, I mean, are we, are we programmed for self-destruction that uh, machines are going to finally take over? Um, you know, I would like to maintain an optimistic view of, of the future of humanity. Um, I think the way we are going about it uh, might pose more scenarios for a doomsday uh, future. Uh, but I think, you know, we have to recognize that technology is as good as its utility for humans. Mm -hmm. uh, I think what, what we did not account for in the longest time was how the usage of technology would change our behavioral patterns, how it would change our behavioral dispositions. And if you look at the arc of emergent technology, it's happening at such a rate that it has become difficult for human behavior to adapt that fast. You know, it's not like there's a 10 year, 20 year, 30 year lag in evolutionary cycle. Um, so I think it's a, it's a, it's a function of, you know, it's, it's, it's more about, um, becoming more mindful of what sort of technologies we design, uh, how much time we spend with them and how do we utilize them. Um, and, if we are mindful of that, I think they can be great uh, assistive tools. Uh, um, otherwise, uh, it will continue to pose certain kinds of challenges that we have seen in recent years. Uh, morning, I was reading some news where Google apparently it seems they have a they have a team called the Ethical Artificial Intelligence Team. <laughs> yeah. um, is this pattern there? What I mean, how? To it comes and goes. <laughs> it comes and goes. I think, you know, one of the challenges with, with any kind of ethical framing uh, is that corporations or governance entities like, like central governments or federal governments, that you have to start thinking of ethics not as a public relations exercise. You, know, you have to seriously think about ethics as something that is core to the culture of the company or core to the culture of the organization. So it had become fashionable a couple of years ago, uh, almost since, say, the, the recent financial meltdown in, in 2008 and 2009, that a lot of companies started to establish, you know, new compliance units or new ethic unit, uh, basically to suggest that they are thinking about it. But they're not empowered. They're not empowered to make suggestions, make any kinds of changes in the culture and so on. So it mostly becomes sort of, you know, an elephant's tusk. You know, it's, it's there for show. Uh, and, and I think that's sort of the biggest uh, uh, shame with, with some of these uh, companies, and especially in the, in the tech environment. And so there has been, I have a couple of friends and colleagues who have been pushing uh, uh, quite a bit um, uh, in, in uh, you know, for companies like Amazon and Microsoft and Google um, to, uh, try to give much more sort of prominent role to an ethics and governance team. Great. Well, a very important topic which has influenced the entire humanity. It is about Corona, the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, so I was just looking at the points that I jotted and this, somehow the topic I've given is karma and Corona. So, so is, is, is there an element of uh, karma uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic that entire humanity is facing? And um, uh, what's your message? I mean, how do we cope with this? How do we work? I, th I think the, the issue is basically from a scientific perspective, we could not have designed a better social experiment at this large scale, okay. um, uh, where you get to study, you know, not only individual behaviors, but behaviors of governments, behaviors of leadership and so on, in the face of uh, a pandemic, which is which is at such a scale. The, the thing to recognize is that, you know, nature has its own way of resetting. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it has its own way of forcing humans to remain humble, uh, about their ability to control things and control outcomes. You know, one of the uh, very fashionable kind of question uh, in the business world is when people ask you, where do you see yourself in three to five years from now? Right? Where do you see yourself five years from now? I bet you 90% of the people who responded to this question in 2015 
we're completely off track. You know, so it, it forces you to, to accept a level of intellectual humility and humility in, in, in a manner where you recognize that, yes, you can make effort, you can make plans, but you don't have all elements, all variables in control, you see. So it pushes this, this sense of human resilience and ability for, uh, you know, uh, adaptation and so on. So I think it's a, you know, despite of all the challenges that humanity is facing because of this pandemic since the beginning of, since the end of last year, pretty much, I think it has also given us an important uh, reset moment. One, to recognize what do we really need in life? Uh, I've been hearing this from a lot of colleagues uh, who have been suggesting that, you know, uh, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a different level of appreciation for what they have in life, uh, mm -hmm. a, a sense of cherishment, a sense of rejoicing around that thing. Um, and the second thing is to, to truly uh, understand the notion of impermanence. You see, impermanence is not a nice, fluffy Buddhist concept. Even if you're not a Buddhist, you'll face it. You see? Uh, so you have to come to recognize uh, that these are unknown variables in life that we should sort of be accepting of. And if you do believe in karma, then to think of it as, yes, it is something that came out of the karmic evolutionary cycle, and here we are, and try to make the best of this time. Uh, great. Uh, there are implications of corona, and uh, an important implication has been the issue of rising uh, mental health. Uh, families are being, uh, you know, the concept of families being redefined, mm -hmm. profession, people are losing their jobs, uh, lives are being lost. Uh, so how does one cope about immense pain and tragedy which humanity is being forced upon? I think, you know, uh, first thing is to recognize and acknowledge that the pain is real. Um, and it does, it is posing um, a lot of challenges, especially for, you know, individuals with daily wages, individuals who are essential workers, um, single mothers uh, who are trying to raise kids at home. Um, you know, uh, it's, 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 it is posing a lot of challenge. And I think this is the time for, uh, one, I think for us to rethink work, uh, mm -hmm. to recognize that the culture and the environments that we had created in the past is not sustainable, uh, meaning that it could get disrupted uh, in the face of another pandemic or another sort of natural calamity of this nature. So it forces us to to rethink the the culture of work itself. the The second part of it is, I think, the role of good leadership. You know, one of the things that the pandemic has presented to us is that you know, good leadership is not just about good GDP. I mean, good governance is not just about whether you are economically booming. You know, here I am in a first world country with, uh, you know, I think about twenty hundred, twenty eight hundred deaths yesterday. You see. So the thing is that it's not about economic viability. It has to do with that, does the government really care? And if the government really cares, then it has to manifest that sense of caring in the economic well-being of the lowest common denominator of its citizens. So daily wage workers, essential workers, single mothers, and so on. And, and so the government needs to step up to, to this task of good governance. And so I think, you know, one of the things that as democratic societies we need to recognize is that good governance means really to have the aptitude and the capability to deal with such crisis. Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, now I'll go to our topic uh, from within your book. In your book, you mentioned two stalwarts of the Buddhist world of the 20th century. And I start with somebody who's uh, been a great figure, but not very popular, Kunu Lama. So uh, would you like to share your association and the teachings of Kunu Lama, how it has influenced your life? There are a lot of Buddhists who will be watching this session, and some of them know about Kunu Lama, and uh, for various reasons, Kunu Lama has always uh, you know, played this modest and not being very out there in the public. So what's your message and what's your experience with your association with Kunu Lama? I recognize Kunu Rinpoche as an aspirational figure. He lived a very noteworthy life in a manner where he did not seek recognitions, he did not seek followers and so on. 
his life was filled with curiosity to the point where he left Kinnor to go all the way to Tibet to study. He studied with some of the greatest masters of the previous century, including Patrul Rinpoche and others. And even when he returned to India, his thirst for learning was such that he further his study of Sanskrit. He hung out with uh, sadhus of various Shaivite traditions in Banaras and so on. And he continuously taught himself things that would be of help also for others. Okay. You know, Konur Rinpoche was not just a Buddhist teacher. He was somebody who could have been an economist, who could have been a linguist, who could have been somebody who traversed so many different knowledge fields and disciplines. But more importantly, the accounts that I have heard of Konur Rinpoche, both from you know, Tibetans, Ladakhis, and, and some Indians who, who came to know him, even some Westerners who came to know him, is this idea of, you know, what is what it means to uh, embody the, the teachings of Buddha Dharma. These days, unfortunately, you know, we are used to only sort of recognizing, again, you know, people with titles and so on. And, and you know, historically, we have made jokes about it when you read, the, again, the life of Kadam masters and so on. But what does it truly mean to be a living Buddha? What does it truly mean to be a precious jewel? In utmost simplicity, I think Kuno Rinpoche manifested all of it till the end of his life. And, and I think that's one of the things that I would encourage individuals. We, we should not read about lives of masters, just praise them. We should read about lives of masters to be inspired by them to be inspired how they lived their life, what were their struggles, what was driving them, you know, and if we can learn some things from that and be able to sort of you know, work on it, I think uh, uh, that would be the best sort of tribute to, to those aspiration failures. Uh, great. Uh, my own experience uh, a little bit with Kunu Lama uh, Vendable is, uh, you mentioned in the book that you actually went to the place in Banaras where you used to stay as a sadhu. Yes. Yeah, so that place is called Lakshmi Kun. Yeah, so I've been to Lakshmi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but I just couldn't locate my karma wasn't there. I spent a whole day trying to locate the mud. I was alone. I couldn't. So maybe next time I'll take you know, some guidance from you to locate the mud. Yeah, so yeah I yeah. whole day there. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful location. Uh, it is sort of you have to uh, go through some, uh, you know, some gullies uh, uh, and, and so on. You know, I, I visited there several times, but one time I remember meeting uh, one of the Swamis there, uh, Swami Brahmanand, uh, who actually had spent time with, with uh, Kono Rinpoche. And so it was it was just wonderful kind of thing to recognize, to listen to account of this individual from a Hindu sadhu about his own sort of uh, ability to express the teachings of Dharma and how he could synthesize between uh, the teachings of, of Shaivite tradition and the Buddhist tradition and so on. Uh, and, and that was the beautiful thing. Um, you know, even His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, who has probably been solely responsible for popularizing Kono Rinpoche in modern day, that when he speaks of him with, with uh, such reverence, and he says that, you know, Kono Rinpoche had this ability that when he was teaching Shantideva's Bodhicharya Avtar or, or Nagarjuna's Mulmadimi Karika, he would be able to explain the verses and see things in verses that were sort of outside the box of uh, you know other buddhist scholars and, and certain mm -hmm. so so he he displayed this this beautiful this beautiful sort of ability to synthesize uh, knowledge from from uh, different disciplines and and i think that's that's just such a wonderful aspirational quality yeah. great my uh, last uh, question as Impermanence sets in our conversation also. <laughs> it can't last for long. Venerable, you mentioned, which was quite a delight to read, that you were very close to the 19th uh, Bakula Rinpoche and you know his value to the people of the dark. Uh, I'm sure people of the dark, would, and I'm sure other people also all across the world, Mongolia and all across, would love to hear about your experience with the 19th Bakula Rinpoche. And apparently your family was also very close to Bakula Rinpoche. Yeah, we, we, it was one of those. Uh funny scenarios that my family was close to him because they were all members of the parliament uh, with, with Bakula Rinpoche. And I was close to him 
because of my interest in Buddhism. Uh, he was a very dear friend of Reverend Sasaki. He was a very dear friend of Fuji Guruji. And so it was only after several years of knowing him that I recognized that he was talking to my family and, and that he knew my family in Delhi and so on. And by that time, uh, Rinpoche was already an ambassador. So he would travel a, a, a fair amount. And, you know, one of the things that, that I, that I tried to mention in the book was, you know, this intrigue, which was that how does he manage his life as a Buddhist monk? and as a diplomat. And because, you know, for my family, this decision of joining a monastery was a very challenging decision. You know, they had other aspirations for me. Um, and so for them, Buckler Rinpoche was sort of a beacon of hope. They were like, okay, you know, if he does something like what Buckler Rinpoche is doing, that would sort of really be a, a path of reconciliation between mm -hmm. what the family is aspiring and, and between what he is, uh, aspires to be. And, and that was the beauty of observing Bakla Rinpoche that, you know, one moment you're asking for a spiritual advice and you're, you're receiving teachings. And he was very refined in his way of explanation, the way he would sort of convey even the, the, the complexity of certain things. And the next moment, you know, there will be sort of some kind of political question or diplomatic relations questions. And you could see, that his, his mind would shift, you see. But it was just this beautiful, seamless, you know, hopping back and forth, which you read about in the life of Bodhisattvas, you know, how Bodhisattvas sort of traverse the stage and samsara and the stage and spiritual life. And Bhakti Rinpoche was a master. And uh, I, you know, uh, was often uh, in awe of him, of course. And, uh, and we had uh, a close relationship because of family because of a variety of projects that that we were part of together and uh, and we had especially close close relationship because uh, i think he was the only figure that my parents and my grandparents would ever listen to they were not willing to listen to any other monk or or any other buddhist figure at that time it was only buckler rinpoche uh, that they had tremendous faith and respect Wonderful. thank you very much uh, again for being part of the dark uh, literature festival your participation adds a lot of value to this event. And I once again, uh, I'd repeat your book out here, and I would actually insist that people should read it like uh, a guide to the complexities uh, that we live in. Wonderful, thank you very much, and I uh, hope to see you in Ladakh someday. Julie. I hope so too. I hope so too. Thank you so very much, and, and thank you for uh, having me. Okay.